met on my first week of medical school here in September of 1963, um, when I was a first year anatomy student in medical school, and, and Don was my TA. Uh, it, it was quite a couple of years ago. Uh, Don, uh, uh, Don had uh, done college work and graduated from Morehouse College. He took his MD from the University of Chicago, as I did, before it was known as the Pritzker School of Medicine. Uh, we were just old U of C. Uh, and then a master in public health uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, for many years, uh, Don has been affiliated with the Carter Presidential Center in Atlanta, uh, where he currently oversees the Carter Center's international health programs in eight African and six Latin American countries. Um, He's led the effort, the worldwide effort, in the eradication of guinea worm disease, an effort that's been associated with the Carter Center. And I just want you to hear some of the numbers about their successes. Um, they have reduced the number of cases of guinea worm disease from 3.5 million in 1986 to fewer than 5,000 in 2008. Let me try that again. Three and a half million to less than 5,000, with, with just a few pockets remaining in southern Sudan and Ghana and Mali and Ethiopia, but fewer than 5,000 cases. Extraordinary. Um, Don has also been very active um, in eradicating river blindness worldwide and other diseases. He's led many projects and focused on smallpox eradication. Uh, he's been a member of seven U.S. delegations to the World Health Assembly. He served as a consultant to, to WHO. He's authored many journal articles and textbooks on a wide variety of public health subjects. He's, in fact, the author of Princes and Peasants, Smallpox in History, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1983 and was reissued in 2002. Um, uh, Don has gotten all of the wonderful medals that are available to someone of his capability and excellence. The CDC Medal of Excellence, the Distinguished Service Medal from the U.S. Public Health Service. He was the winner of the MacArthur uh, Genius Fellowship in 1995, and currently serves on, on the Board of Directors of the MacArthur Foundation. I, I could go on and on with his, with his honorary degrees and doctorates and things, but I, I don't want to take away from the time. It is a delight, Don. It's a delight to welcome you back to the University of Chicago um, and look forward to hearing you as well. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It is indeed a pleasure to, uh, to be back, and this hall in particular brings back a lot of, uh, a lot of memories. I remember particularly uh, Dr. Douglas's, Dr. Douglas Buchanan's uh, erudite discussions in this room on Saturday mornings about uh, pediatric uh, neurology. But uh, we're talking about something different today. As Mark has indicated, we're going to talk about this uh, eradication of guinea worm uh, disease, and God willing, it will be gone before any of you have a chance to uh, get your teeth in it, so to speak. But there are lots of uh, lessons to be, uh, to be learned here, particularly having to do with international public health. But I want to also mention there are ethical issues here as well. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time to uh, discuss uh, some of these issues uh, after the formal presentation, and please feel free to interrupt me as we go along. But if you would just think as we're going through about some of the uh, issues, ethical issues related to neglect of people in rural areas, the disenfranchisement of people of uh, certain ethnicities, the um, inequities involved in uh, rural water supply, and to some people, the ethical issue of eliminating uh, a species 
altogether. Now, uh, I refer casually to this parasite as the great worm. Uh, I have also uh, noted on uh, previous occasions that this, as you can see, is the ultimate, in one sense, of an emerging infectious disease. <laughs> this parasite comes out of people a year after they've been infected, and uh, these worms are two to three feet long. They're uh, thin like a uh, thin strand of uh, spaghetti, and they come out of any part of the body. This is a relatively tame slide. I've spared you the worst slides. I'll show you a, a few more just to indicate uh, some of the uh, places of the body that this can come out of, but I just leave the rest to your imagination. I have another slide of four that is much worse than, uh, than this one. But when you stop and think about the fact that people have been, and a few still are being, infected by this parasite year after year, and that they um, have to, uh, to live, to, uh, to cook, some to try to go to school, to farm, and do all kinds of other things that people do with a worm hanging out of their body for several weeks, uh, often very painfully. And if you're especially unlucky, while most people who are infected have only one worm to emerge in a given guinea worm season, if you're especially unlucky, you can have a dozen or more worms to emerge simultaneously. And if you're especially unlucky uh, to have a worm emerge in a place much more vital than what you, what you see here. The parasite, uh, when emerging, is uh, that's the female worm that li lives to that stage of adulthood and comes out of the body. The males by then have, uh, have died. And uh, that female worm is a gigantic uterus that is seeking to eject hundreds of thousands of larvae back into the fresh water supply to infect new people, which, which infections will be manifest a year later. But these are the kind of water sources that we're talking about. Open sources uh, such as ponds into which people wade or bathe or wash clothes or whatever. And on the left, you see there a um, step well from India typical of uh, such wells in uh, different parts of, uh, of Asia in former years. And at the bottom, a highly uh, magnified copepod or water flea, which contains the immature larvae. When the worm, when the adult worm spews these hundreds of thousands of larvae out into the water, they only, the larvae will only live for two or three weeks unless they're eaten by a, a copepod. In the copepod, they um, develop over a couple of weeks, and only then is the parasite infectious to anyone who drinks water containing that infected copepod. The larval forms of the parasite are invisible to the naked eye. You can barely see copepods as a speck of light if you hold water from a pond like that up to the light. You can see these little things swimming around uh, jerkily, and we'll come back to that a little later. When the program started in the mid-1980s, and I should note that a year from now, October 2010, will mark 30 years that uh, this has been a part of my life. I, I, had, I had wanted to do tropical medicine, so-called, from before I came to medical school. Part of the interest in that derived from um, a picture of this parasite in a biology textbook my sophomore year in college. Uh, it's the kind of thing that once you see it, you don't forget. But this is where it remained in the mid-1980s. In the early part of the 20th century, the parasite was much more widespread into the southern part of the uh, then Soviet Union, across much more of the, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and, and a little bit further south in Africa as well. Now, um, normally the parasite doesn't kill people. Uh, it's content to make people miserable, but it does uh, cripple people temporarily for periods averaging in some studies two to three months because of the, um, uh, of the associated secondary infections around the site of the emergence of the worm. When the uh, parasite is about to emerge, 
the adult female parasite, which is in the tissues, um, comes out under the skin, ejects some kind of a toxin which burns a lot. People know in endemic areas to put that part of their body into fresh water causes that blister to rupture through which the worm can then eject these hundreds of thousands of larvae. It also leaves at the base a small ulcer that often becomes secondarily infected. Uh, if you're only mildly unlucky, it gets secondarily infected with various viruses or bacteria or whatever. If you're very unlucky, it gets infected secondarily with Clostridium tetani, and of course that can kill people. In the bad old days, the mid-1980s, in Burkina Faso, uh, the majority share of tetanus infections admitted to hospital in the capital uh, city of Ouagadougou were because of secondary infections from this, from this parasite. I saw a young man in, uh, in Ghana uh, about uh, 20 years ago now about late, late teens, that year his village uh, had gotten a safe water supply uh, the year before, and there were fewer cases of guinea worm in the village that year, much fewer than the village had suffered years before, but he was one of that year's victims as well. Um, by the next year, the village almost certainly was free of guinea worm disease, but that last infection that he had, in that instance, the worm came out next to his knee one of his knees. And when I saw him a few months later, uh, his right leg looked exactly as if he'd had polio. Uh, the, uh, the worm had uh, caused the knee to freeze up, and the muscles below the knee had, uh, had shriveled. And as I said, he looked exactly as if, as if he'd had polio. But most people don't have that consequence. But they are temporarily crippled because of the pain associated with wherever this worm is coming out on their body, so that people can't walk, can't farm, children can't get to school, uh, et, et, et cetera. And as I mentioned, that can be for uh, 10 to 12 weeks or more. Now, this is an example data from southeast Nigeria from a professor in Wosu who showed that in the uh, so called guinea worm uh, season early in the calendar year, the um, rate of absenteeism in this school uh, peaked at over 60% of, uh, of pupils. And remember uh, that this is, these are not kids missing two days of school. They're missing several weeks of school. And if that happens year after year, it's, it's uh, a, a big handicap. And the same thing happens to farmers. No vaccine, no curative uh, drug. And so the interventions that we have are to prevent the infection, and they are decidedly low-tech, most of them. In essence, you have the former head of state of Ghana in 1988, who kicked off Ghana's guinea worm eradication campaign by touring more than a dozen villages over a period of eight days, uh, talking to the people about guinea worm disease. In, uh, in this photograph, you, you may be able to see he has a, he's holding a magnifying glass, educating the village elders about these little things swimming around in the water that they're drinking. Uh, now, I, you know, we, we don't have, uh, as you see here, an ejection or some way to cure people very easily. So we have to convince people that something that the water they drank a year ago is the cause of this year's misery. And on top of that, many people have very, very strong traditional beliefs about what the real cause of this parasite is. And so you have to overcome all of that. One of the most powerful ways to do that is to show people that there are little things swimming around in the water that they're drinking. Never mind, you know, that there are copepods and inside the copepod is a parasite. People instinctively do not like the idea that there are things swimming around in the water that they're drinking. And that helps make the connection to actions a year ago. Now this is just to, to illustrate the different ways in which we can prevent the uh, parasite from getting into people's bodies. Any finely woven cloth, such as my shirt, will, um, won't filter out viruses and bacteria, but it will filter out those water fleas containing the copepods. And, um, the, and so um, the DuPont Corporation donated many years ago uh, over two million square yards of nylon filter material that we've used to uh, help construct uh, or help people construct cloth filters to uh, 
pour the water from uh, a source such as this into the pots that they use through the filter to filter out those copepods and whatever other gross junk may be in the, in the water supply. The significance of nylon filters is that you can use a cotton cloth such as my shirt, but cotton fibers swell when they get wet, and so the water filters, even if it were clear water, it filters more slowly than nylon filters, which don't swell, and nylon lasts longer also in the tropics than uh, cloth filters. We also began to uh, uh, develop these uh, pipes, like a large straw, but with a filter in it, so that people could hang it around their neck and take it when they're farming, visiting, trading, doing whatever, away from their, their village, where the cloth filters are usually used in the, uh, in the household. In, uh, in addition, there is a chemical abate that can be put into the water once every four weeks that is colorless, tasteless, odorless, leaves the water safe for human beings to drink at one part per million, does not kill fish, does not kill plant life, does kill the copepods and with it the parasites. And unlike chlorine, which will have the same effect, it lasts for four weeks. Chlorine, especially in sunlight, only lasts for a day or two. We've talked about uh, educating people about the, uh, where this parasite comes from to always filter their drinking water and to whatever else they do if they have a worm coming out of their body, not to contaminate the water supply, not to allow the worm to contaminate the water supply for everybody else. The best way, the ideal way to prevent the infection, however, is to provide borehole wells um, or a hand dug well that's protected with a parapet so that water can't run back into the well. That way the water that's coming from underground cannot be contaminated with anybody who happens to have a worm coming out of their leg or something, but that is also the most expensive and the slowest intervention. On the other hand, it prevents a lot of other things besides guinea worm disease, and we'll come back to that as an ethical issue. Uh, some, I'll just give you an example. Um, a person once from a, uh, an international agency actually said to me that he felt it was, didn't use the word, unethical uh, to promote the use of these cloth filters because that relieved the political pressure for people getting you know, the best intervention, which is uh, the borehole wells. And so the, the issue is, do you want to make people wait for the best intervention uh, or not? Uh, and is that in itself uh, unethical? All right, so a bad disease, there are lots of bad diseases. This one we have some ways of intervening but can it be eradicated altogether? I chair an international task force disease eradication at the Carter Center, and uh, in it we've developed uh, two sets of criteria, one being the scientific feasibility of eradication, which is what we coming out of medicine and public health often think of, and that is uh, to state it negatively, and these characteristics are talking about guinea worm disease, but if you have a, a, a parasite, a virus, or bacterium that has a reservoir in say, wild monkeys or any wild animal or in the environment such as tetanus bacilli, um, you're not going to be able to eradicate it. It's always there. So you uh, want, you must have something that has no uh, uh, reservoir outside of human beings. If it has a natural seasonality as guinea worm does, as smallpox did, that can make it easier to attack during the low periods, especially if it's a person-to-person -person thing, which guinea worm is not. In the case of guinea worm, very easy to diagnose. There's not much else that's going to be mistaken for a worm like that coming out of somebody's uh, body. We have practical interventions that I just showed you, and we also have, uh, coming up, evidence of eradicability. But the other criteria are political will pop to the support. You can have something that, in theory, medically, scientifically, is amenable to eradication, but you still need to have uh, political support to do so. And in that instance, if you have something that's killing people, which guinea worm usually does not, guinea worm is a dramatic illness. It is a significant burden to agriculture and school attendance, and the World Bank estimated a very significant economic rate of return of getting rid of it based just on the impact on agriculture. World Bank considers that any economic rate of return, 10% or more, is a good rate of return. Uh, and you see here, um, a, a quite significant rate of return. Evidence of eradicability. We had only scraps of such evidence when we uh, began, apart from our imagination. And here you have a village 
this village was about 3,000 people in Togo. Uh, sorry, about 3,000 uh, people, a third or more of whom were uh, infected, uh, as, you, as you see here. And you can see what happened as the people began doing health education and then mobilized to get a well in, in that village. So that was um, village-based evidence. In Ghana, in 1989, the government of uh, Japan, Japan International uh, Cooperation Agency, put in these uh, wells in the Numa district. So this is an entire district over uh, a course of a little bit more than a year. They went to this district precisely because it had so much guinea worm. It was a big agricultural uh, area. And you can see that district-wide, they went in one year from um, over 12,000, over 13,000 cases in the district, a 77% reduction in one year. So here we have a district-wide um, evidence of impact. And this was relatively early in the, uh, in the campaign uh, as well and was useful for advocacy purposes. But we still come back to the question, why not just control it? And here is a main part of the uh, rationale that uh, copepods are ubiquitous. And in fact, here in North America, wild-caught raccoons, skunks, foxes, they have their own guinea worm cycle. Fortunately, that guinea worm does not come into humans. Um, it may come, but not mature in, uh, in humans. And human ones does not go into any kind of uh, a wild animal. In fact, um, at CDC, we were trying to get an animal model for guinea worm going using wild caught raccoons and wild caught copepods from uh, suburban uh, Atlanta area. We had it going temporarily, but, but, uh, but not. But the fact is that the environment is receptive to various degrees in much of the world, especially tropical world, but not just the tropical world. And it only takes one person to contaminate the village's water supply, and that water supply will then be contaminated for everybody, not just for that person. And so here you have three examples in Eritrea, 1968, one imported case in a previously non-endemic area, an explosion of over 68 cases. Ghana in 1994, ethnic fighting uh, disrupted the campaign the program, doubled cases from one year to the next. And just three years ago in Mali, a Quranic student walked over 300 kilometers to the north of Mali up near the border with Algeria to an area that had never had uh, guinea worm in the living memory of the people living there. Unbeknownst to the folks there, he had a guinea worm to come out. He contaminated the local water supply. And uh, the next year, they had 85 uh, cases of guinea worm in that one village. The advantage was the people in that village were not used to having guinea worm. Now, I've often wondered, and I think I mentioned earlier, I've often wondered how people stay sane with this a you know, worm hanging out in their body all this time, so much less year after year. Well, somehow they do, and they know some things about the worm, have their own traditional beliefs. Stuff. But here you had an area where people knew nothing about this worm, and the advantage to us in the eradication program was that they were really hell-bent on getting rid of this thing <laughs> as fast, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we had the, the problem up in that area of um, insecurity. And so the, uh, the first year, it was a year before we even knew there was an infection because nobody knew that this guy had contaminated the water supply until these cases turned up a year later. And at that time, there was a delay in reporting and delay in putting interventions in place because there was in insecurity in the area. Um, Al-Qaeda and some other uh, bad folks, uh, according to several sources. Now, and again, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's different from uh, rounds and, and presenting things in medicine. And here we were presented with a challenge in 1986. Uh, nobody had heard of, well, very few people had heard of this disease. Uh, fewer were interested in it. And we had the challenge of trying to mobilize support for it. Uh, Mark mentioned I was on several delegations, U.S. delegations to the World Health Assembly for on CDC's uh, behalf. And uh, this is each May where the ministers of health from around the world come together and uh, think big thoughts and make resolutions. But at CDC, we had the challenge of convincing people to support a resolution to get rid of guinea worm disease. We had uh, 
eight panels, the text and titles of which had to be in English and in French. And in the course of those eight panels, uh, using some of the pictures you've already seen and some other things, we had to show where guinea worm was, what it was, what it looked like, how it could be uh, prevented, and what the world needed to do about it, and we did it. But uh, we were lucky in that um, by happenstance, as far as I know, the uh, people who arranged all of these exhibits at the World Health Assembly put our exhibit in the best possible place. Uh, because there, there are two committees at the World Health Assembly. U.S. US delegation, for example, like many, many delegations of most larger countries, have technical people like me and the folks from CDC, NIH, FDA, depending on the subject, and they have the political folks from Department of State in the U.S.'s entrance. And so there are two committees. A, Committee A is the, uh, the technical folks. Committee B are the political folks. Um, um, the technical people met behind this wall. The political folks met across the hall in a, a, uh, an identical auditorium. But both groups for the coffee breaks had to pass here. <laughs> and so everybody saw this uh, exhibit at one time or another, and it helped to get uh, support for the effort. That was in uh, May of 1986. Here we were in July, and we were pushing both of these things simultaneously. In July, we were already ready, following the resolution, the first African Regional Conference on Guinea worm disease in uh, Niamey, Niger. And then that November, uh, I was still at CDC, but Bill Fagey, whom some of you may know, was executive director of the Carter Center then, and I, who had worked together at CDC, he was former director of CDC, persuaded President Carter to talk to the uh, head of state of Pakistan. Carter was going to uh, China and agreed to, he was stopping in Pakistan anyway, he agreed to talk to the head of state of Pakistan about guinea worm disease. India had already started the eradication program, but we had not had success in getting Pakistan's attention over this issue. So President Carter was there in early November 1986, spoke to General Zia, and before November 86 was out, General Zia sent two of his chief public health people to the Carter Center, and here's where we are. President Carter spent two hours that afternoon, we had an all-day seminar, talking about guinea worm eradication in Pakistan. And the Carter Center agreed to help Pakistan get rid of guinea worm disease. That was the Carter Center's first, interest, first entry into the guinea worm wars. 1989, money was a problem in the beginning. Again, people didn't know about guinea worm disease, and uh, not everyone cared about it. So we, we organized a, a donors conference in Lagos, Nigeria, at the uh, Sheridan Hotel in Akeja. And uh, here, you have uh, President Carter, then head of state of uh, Nigeria, General Ibrahim uh, Babangida, the newly, then newly appointed Sultan of uh, Sokoto, and back here is uh, Pierre Claver de Miba, who was the, he's from Burkina Faso. He was at the time the uh, Assistant Director General of the United Nations Development Program for Africa. And um, we approached him as we were organizing this, this uh, donors conference. And you'll see some of this later, but I have to keep coming back to the fact that people, most people didn't care about guinea worm disease then. And so uh, when we invited him uh, to the Carter Center to talk about this problem, we wanted two things. We wanted money from UNDP, and we wanted him to agree to uh, chair this conference. And he did. Uh, he did uh, both things, and we are eternally grateful to him because we had one other UN health agency at the time which refused to co-sponsor this, uh, this conference. President Carter in 1995, as we were trying to get Sudan mobilized, even though they were still in the middle of a civil war, President Carter negotiated a uh, ceasefire which came to be known, this is a Cairo newspaper, as the guinea worm ceasefire. This ceasefire lasted for six months, and in the process, we outside and the Sudanese health workers on both sides of the Civil War surprised all of us ourselves in how much we were able to do with this ceasefire. And then we surprised ourselves again by how much was able to be done following the ceasefire because people weren't fighting, fighting everywhere all the time in the areas where people uh, weren't uh, fighting. But people often ask, why is it taking so long? And at first, our target year for getting rid of guinea worm disease was 1995. Well, you can see here that it was only in 1995 when we got 
all of the uh, endemic countries mobilized against guinea worm uh, disease. Yemen didn't even know that they had guinea worm until 1990, until 1994, when they uh, went back and uh, and looked. And by the way, it was a I had been going many years to Tulane in New Orleans to lecture about this disease to medical students. A medical student from Yemen who came up to me after my lecture in early 1994, who said that when he got home that summer, he was going to look for guinea worm. And I'll never forget, it was November 11th, federal holiday. I was at home, and uh, I got a call from this guy who was at a public telephone in the back of beyond of Yemen. Dr. Hopkins, he said, we have guinea worm in Yemen. We have guinea worm in, uh, in Yemen. And uh, that was wonderful. They got rid of it fairly quickly. But the, the point is that uh, the mobilization was, uh, was very slow. The Carter Center took on Pakistan, then Nigeria, and Ghana. And, and later, we uh, put people into Uganda and uh, Niger and Mali. We helped everybody else indirectly, except uh, India, which um, took care of its own uh, problem without our help. Now, the backbone of this program has been village volunteers. Uh, as the word implies, generally not paid. We provide t-shirts and little things like that. But we also provide uh, support, encouragement, feedback, training, retraining, and supplies, and sympathetic supervision. And we train them to do the things uh, indicated here in their own neighborhoods. And they have been very, very effective uh, in that regard. And I should note also that uh, across all of the endemic countries, about 40% of the workforce of the Guinea Worm Eradication Program are female. Now, just to show that this is not just the Carter Center, first of all, you have the uh, endemic countries themselves, their ministries of health. And I have two slides here, um, the next one in a minute, equally dense, uh, just indicating the different organizations, NGOs, um, international organizations, and uh, foundations, other entities that are supporting this eradication uh, effort, which while the effort began at, uh, at CDC and then leadership moved to the Carter Center in 1986, we also work heavily with now with UNICEF and with the World Health Organization. And here you see the other slide, and again, all of these other organizations. But I want to point out that of all the endemic countries, Nigeria is the only one which made a direct donation, in this instance, to the Carter Center. All the countries are supporting their own efforts internally. But the government of Nigeria, on two occasions, donated a million dollars on each occasion to the Carter Center for the gay worm eradication uh, effort. Nigeria having been, as you'll see in a minute, the most highly affected country uh, once we began looking at this problem. Now, uh, health education, um, again, uh, the problem of convincing people that this disease is caused by water they drank a year ago and that they should always filter their water, that they should stay out of the water if they have a worm coming out of their uh, bodies re re report, uh, and, and report uh, cases. So you're, the, the idea is to try to get this message coming at people from every possible direction all the time. I like to liken it to the way at least I involuntarily find myself humming, overtly or not, some advertising jingle when they go in the grocery store and see some. That's the kind of way you want people to react every time they go to collect drinking water or think about drinking water for an open source. You want them to automatically remember that they need to filter their drinking water. And so here you have a baseball, pat, baseball cap with the top cut out and sewn in instead of the normal top is a cloth filter so that they can have that out on, on the farm. In addition, we persuaded a manufacturer in Burkina Faso to, we sent him some designs and told him to design an attractive guinea worm cloth in a, with a few words in English and in French to be used in both sets of countries with guinea worm messages on it. He did, and that became very, um, just very, very popular. And there, must, there are over a dozen versions of this uh, by one country or another now. And one of my favorite memories was when we had a big meeting in Burkina Faso. The Minister of Health came to the meeting dressed head to toe in um, that kind of guinea worm cloth. 
and, but the, the, the organizer of the program had also draped the podium in the same cloth. And so it was like a, a tiger going into the long grass when this guy got behind the podium. All you could see was his, uh, was his face. Importance of political mobilization. Uh, not the normal uh, medical uh, topic, but very important. And here you had, uh, have three examples. Uh, President Carter, of course, we've already talked about. But President Carter also persuaded in 1992, then former head of state of Mali, now the current elected president of Mali, General Amadou Tamani Touré, to take this guinea worm issue on. Mali was lagging behind then, and uh, um, uh, General Touré, when President Carter asked him on a visit to Mali, uh, Ture reportedly said to President Carter, well, if you can come all the way from Georgia worrying about guinea worm in Mali, the least I can do is help. And uh, he not only uh, helped, he visited, he doesn't speak English, but he visited not just throughout Mali, but all the other endemic, guinea worm endemic French countries, 10 of them, to advocate with their Minister of Health and their heads of state about guinea worm. Months after he took this on, his mother told him that she had been, that guinea worm was the reason she had been expelled from school and had not finished her schooling because she missed so many days because of guinea worm disease. Then he really became a maniac about the guinea worm <laughs> disease. 1998, President Carter persuaded uh, former head of state of Nigeria, General Yakubu Gowan, uh, to take on the guinea worm issue in Nigeria where the program was stagnating at the time. And that was 1998. He began, was September, he began working, General Gowan did, in early 1999, and the cases started dropping again in Nigeria in 2000, a year later, reflecting the one-year incubation uh, period. By uh, 2005, General Gowan had visited over 100 Guinea worm endemic villages in over 18 states of, uh, of Nigeria. He's now doing a tour around the country from time to time, not all at once going back to uh, states that were endemic, thanking them, the governors and the local political leaders, for um, having taken on this issue because as you will see, Nigeria, we think, is now uh, free of guinea worm uh, disease. Political mobilization in 2004, five years ago, World Health Assembly, uh, again, trying to keep this issue before. One of the things that happened in eradication program is when the cases start going down, people lose interest. And so um, to help keep interest, uh, President Carter agreed to go to the World Health Assembly and we staged this thing where we had a, uh, an hour-long session with uh, ministers of health from the remaining endemic countries and they all signed a, um, a document, so-called Geneva Declaration of 2004. And there was another assembly, full assembly resolution that year as well. But another example of political mobilization. One of the other most powerful things has been to uh, not just publish accounts of the guinea worm eradication program in medical German journals or even in newspapers, but as I like to say, to use the data to make the right people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And one way we did that was by um, you know, listing all the guinea worm endemic countries and the number of known endemic villages in, in, in that country and then uh, what proportion of those endemic villages had any intervention against guinea worm in it. It counted for a village if anybody had distributed one cloth filter. In the beginning it did. If they were using a bait, if they were doing something about water supply, if they'd done some health education, somebody done, that counted. And then we uh, looked at and compared the proportion of endemic villages for each country that had at least one intervention. This was September 1990. Uh, to, we did this when uh, President Carter was going to the five of the Francophone endemic countries the first time when we met General Touré for the first time, and that's uh, what it looked like then. A year later, that's what it looked like. You could see the progress. And a year after that, about 11 months after that, this is what it looked like. Um, because um, nobody wants their country to be down here. And uh, so that was a, a very important motivated. Here's another way that we used uh, the data. One year incubation period. So in the case of smallpox eradication, two weeks incubation, you could look back every two weeks and see whether you were effective or not. And 
take corrective measures. Here you've got a year-long incubation period, which is much more difficult. So uh, the challenge then was to try to reflect that. And so what we did, year-long incubation on average is actually 10 to 14 months, but averaging 12 months. This worm needs to stay synchronized with the environment. Just below the Sahara Desert, for example, rainy season is very short, our summer. That's when the worm comes out, and that's when it's transmitted, because that's the only time of year when you have surface water. So the rest of the time, it's, it's dry. People still have to get water from somewhere, but they're not getting it from surface water sources, or there are many fewer surface water sources. So they have peak transmission in, in our summer. In the closer to the Atlantic Ocean, where there's longer rainy season, there the worm, the peak worm transmission, year-round transmission, but peak transmission occurs during the dry season. Why? During the rainy season, there's a lot of water. So it's diluting whatever pollutants are in the, in the water. Not only that, but a lot of the water that's there on the surface is running in rivers and streams and things. Copepods require stagnant water. But it's during the dry season, when people in riverbeds, for example, are almost dry, people dig down into them, so you have stagnant water there. Or the ponds have shrunk down to highly polluted. So that's when you have peak transmission. So Nigeria, for example, had two peak transmission seasons. In the south, it peaked in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, winter months, our winter months in the north during the, during the summer months. And so we just reflected data each month. October 2009 cases reflect the efficacy of efforts done a year ago or not. And um, so that's what we uh, showed here. And so it became exciting to look each month to see what this year's bars would look like. Now, this was for Ghana, but you could do it for a district in Ghana, for a village in Ghana, or for whatever, and you could compare different parts of Ghana. And that's what we did here. Remember I showed you on a previous slide we counted any intervention. Now we're looking at the individual interventions. A proportion of village-based health workers uh, trained, health education abate, uh, water supply, um, using cloth filters, et cetera. And you look at each in interventions, and there you could compare. In this instance, we were comparing Sudan against itself from one year to another. You could similarly compare villages, districts, et cetera. But by far, this is the most popular comparison to show the uh, <laughs> different countries and, and how they are progressing one to another. Annual program reviews have, have been uh, very effective to maintain peer pressure, to uh, get countries competing uh, in friendly fashion against one another and learning from one another. We use former uh, uh, Peace Corps volunteers, many of them, and, and as well as uh, health workers that we trained from the countries themselves to provide uh, uh, supervision for those village-based health workers. And now we come to what has happened. Estimated three and a half million cases in uh, 1986. When we started doing but had incomplete village-by-village village, nationwide searches, starting with Nigeria and Ghana, kind of, sorry, counted almost a million cases in 1989. And here you just see blown up the, the end here. And as Mark mentioned, last year we were down under 5,000 cases for the first time. Uh, this is uh, cases reported. This is number of, of villages reported. Peak when we started counting them of over uh, 23,000 villages with just over 1,000 endemic villages remaining now. Uh, there's been an increasingly um, uh, concerning problem of cases uh, walking, people incubating the disease, walking from um, going somehow from one country to another, and uh, that has also uh, gone down. One of the Peace Corps volunteers who worked in Ivory Coast came back, decided to go to medical school, went to Vanderbilt, and in her first year diagnosed the case of guinea worm disease in uh, Nashville, a um, teenage Sudanese uh, girl who uh, came to Nashville and brought her guinea worm with her. A, another surprised obstetrician, given where we are, um, in a great hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, saw a guinea worm coming out of a woman's cervix. Here geographically, the reduction in the uh, geographic area affected. 
And now, just to show, uh, as of 2008, we start out with 20 countries, and we're down to six countries. In uh, terms of the number of endemic villages, we already reported on that, down to just over 1,000. These are some of the um, several hundred female uh, Ghana Red Cross workers who worked as village volunteers in Ghana. And here you have the um, number of cases uh, reported. We've already talked about that. And here, as, as of the end of 2008, where we were, 20 countries, the year in which these countries had their last case of the disease, and the six remaining endemic countries as of the end of 2008. Now, note that when Ghana counted its cases nationwide for the first time in 1989, Ghana counted just under 180,000 cases. When Nigeria counted its cases the first time in 1989, Nigeria counted over 650,000 cases. When Uganda did their nationwide search in 1991-1992, they counted over 126,000 cases. So it can, be, it can be done. Now we're coming to the end. 2009 is the year, and this is the relevant part of the text of that so-called Geneva delegation that I showed the picture of President Carter signing a while back, where the remaining endemic countries in 2004 uh, committed themselves, along with the supporting key supporting agencies, to getting rid of this thing by the end of 2009. And now we look at where we are. But the meaning of that, getting rid of, getting rid of in 2009, uh, means that we need to um, con getting rid of, uh, contain every case this year so that there will be zero cases in 2010. And we have this definition of case containment that you don't have to go into, but it, it's, the point of this is to say you need to uh, aim to identify a case before or within 24 hours of the worm coming out and take containment measures to assure yourselves that that person is not contaminated with well. That's the basis of case containment. Uh, of that definition of case containment. And now then, in 2008, uh, how did we do? Well, we, we're looking here in red at the, the peak times of transmission in Sudan, peak transmission in Ghana, peak transmission in, in Mali. Any case in Ethiopia, since they had so few, so few, is in red because that's important. And the few cases remaining in Nigeria, last case there in November last year, and in uh, Niger Republic, last case there in October last year. Sudan is the biggest problem in as you as you've seen, and uh, these are the main endemic areas. Civil war was settled in uh, January, or the peace agreement was signed January of uh, 2005, and they resuscitated the Guinea Ryan program in the south where all the fighting had been. And here you just see, I just want you to appreciate going from 2006, 2007, 2008, the bars represent the proportion of known endemic villages in southern Sudan that have these different interventions. And you can see they've been increasing their interventions in southern Sudan. And over that period, they went from 20,582 cases to under 4,000 uh, uh, cases, from 3,000 plus endemic villages to under 1,000 plus endemic villages. And here you see a line graph showing cases by month through September 2009 compared to cases by month for all of 2008. 87% of endemic villages reported last year, 92% reporting so far this year. So getting better and better, and 83% of all their cases contained this year. In Ghana, second highest endemic country, for the first time, Last month and the year before, Ghana had one case only in each month. We were hoping they would have a zero case month then, but so far they haven't had a zero case month. But that's the nadir in Ghana's uh, yearly guinea worm. Mali is still having a relatively small problem, but significant. This reflects that outbreak up north that I told you about earlier. And we were expecting, uh, until we got the September numbers, that Mali was going to be much less this year. And here you have um, 
the uh, border area of southern Sudan and western Ethiopia where cases have been going uh, back and forth, mostly from Sudan into Ethiopia, but indigenous cases still in Ethiopia. And here you have Nigeria. Nigeria says they contained all their cases last year, and knowing the people in charge there, I believe that. And so we're, we're waiting to see what happens in November this year. Uh, if Nigeria reports no case in November this year, that uh, being the average one year since the last known indigenous case, even though they contained all of their cases last year, we will be fairly certain that Nigeria will have broken uh, transmission altogether. This is where we are in all the remaining countries. Uh, Sudan with 2,500 cases. This is all of, as of nine is September of month. All of these data are as of September last month. Just under 2,500 cases in Sudan, 83% of which were contained. Ghana contained 93% of their cases remaining. Mali, 73%. Ethiopia, 96%. Niger and Nigeria have had no indigenous cases so far this year. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Sure. What are the relative populations we're dealing with since I don't really understand the size of this country? Um, I'm not going to be able to do all. Nigeria, though, is the biggest of, of the African countries. Uh, about 140 million, more or less. Ghana, roughly 20 million. Mali, I'm not sure. Ethiopia is about 75 million uh, people. Um, Sudan, uh, not certain. Um, on the order, I think, of maybe 40 million, something like that. But don't don't hold me don't hold me to that. But the 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 the, the, the issue is the elected populations within you know wherever wherever you are. And here now, finally, is the uh, similar graph I showed you for 2008. This is where we are as of September 2009. Nothing so far this year in Nigeria and this year. And we believe, not would, even artificial would, uh, we believe that uh, we're going to uh, be down to four countries uh, in 2010, which is not zero countries, is what we're aiming for. And uh, neither is under 5,000 cases, zero cases yet. And that's what counts in this instance, zero cases. But we're getting there. But this, this one year incubation period is a killer. This is the latest data from WHO. Next week, I'll be in Geneva again. The International Commission for Certification of Conchalysis and uh, Eradication will meet again next week. They'll be looking at some other countries. But right now, WHO has certified 180 countries free of the disease. Uh, they have uh, 21 countries still to be certified. Uh, Cambodia is the only country outside of Africa still to be uh, certified. The rest of the countries are uh, in uh, our African uh, countries. So what has happened with this vertical disease? We've reduced the incidence down, not yet at 100%, but down there. Improved agricultural productivity, school attendance. Talked about the economic rate of return. Indirect improvement in infant nutrition. Data from Sudan showed that if a household had either parent with guinea worm disease the year before, and there were infants in that hospital, or an infant in that hospital, the infant or infants were statistically much more likely to be malnourished the subsequent year because people can't farm and they have uh, this problem. Increased provision of clean water by advocacy in some areas, established the community-based health workers to educate, mobilize, do surveillance. Four month long guinea worm ceasefire that actually lasted almost six months. Uh, this is what the cost. Polio eradication campaign, which affects many more countries, is at $6 billion and counting. Smallpox eradication a year ago was $300 million uh, in, in round uh, numbers. Uh, the guinea worm eradication effort is going to come in at about $300 million, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, less than that. Some of the uh, characteristics of uh, what we've had to do, having had almost no money in the beginning and uh, actual uh, scorn from uh, some folks. Neglected because it was underreported. Here's Ghana and Nigeria reporting three, four, five thousand cases a year of a disease that wasn't killing people. When they start doing, this is when they did the nationwide village based search, you see what they, what they saw. This is what I've just shown you. I've shown you data from September, all of the countries. I could tell you what proportion of those countries were, what proportion of those cases were contained. This is annual data reported to the World Health Organization we were beginning. 
look at all these holes uh, there. Uh, not good reporting uh, either. Other handicaps, I've said many times that ministers of agriculture should have gone after guinea worm disease, even when ministers of health weren't paying attention because this was such uh, important. UNICEF estimated in one small area of, I think it was 1.9 million people in southeast Nigeria, they had a lot of guinea worm, was very fertile for growing rice. They estimated that the rice farmers alone in that one corner of Nigeria were losing the equivalent of $20 million U.S. per year because they couldn't harvest all the rice they had planted because so many were down with guinea worm. And what I may not have told you is that in the bad old days, you had 20, 40, 60, 70 percent or more of village population infected at the same time for the long periods I did tell you about at the season. And that season was right at the peak demand for agricultural labor. You were planting or harvesting their crops. So it's not a matter of getting your brother, your in-law, your cousin to come help you. They're sick also. And so this disease uh, was costing a lot agriculturally. And again, another principle in we come at this sometimes too defensively from the public health side. It's not that it's going to cost $300 million about to get rid of guinea worm disease. It's that guinea worm disease, uneradicated, is costing a lot more than that. A uh, graduate student in Nigeria came home from getting his PhD at Johns Hopkins University. His PhD was not on, on guinea worm uh, disease, but he saw this disease, gave an interview to this reporter, which produced these headlines. And and uh, this is two or three days after these two headlines appeared. The Ministry of Health is scrambling to do something. Mm -hmm. And a year later, UNICEF went and did water supply. So this is what we have been trying to make happen globally. Funding insecurity in uh, all four of the countries uh, remaining and these neglected minority uh, populations uh, that illustrate uh, here. And this is my, uh, my, my final uh, slide and with the implied ethics. When you think about what's going on in the United States right now, just yesterday's health care business in, in committee, um, the environment and all of these big issues, uh, the public interest requires doing today those things that intelligent uh, men and women of good will would wish five or ten years hence had been done. I mentioned to Mark that last week I was on the border between Haiti and Dominican Republic with President Carter. We had gone down there to promote, uh, beginning a year ago, the Carter Center put a little money, a couple hundred thousand dollars in there to help promote an idea. And the problem is, was, is that Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which comprise that island of Hispaniola, that island is the only remaining island in the Caribbean that still has malaria. All the other islands that had it have gotten rid of it. Uh, it can be gotten rid of. Uh, the parasite is still susceptible to chloroquine, and the mosquito is still susceptible to uh, internal indoor residual spraying with DDT and, and bed nets and all of, all, all of that. Also, that island contains 92% of all of the lymphatic filariasis, another parasite, uh, causing swelling of the legs, breasts, genitals, and others. 92% um, of all the lymphatic filariasis in the Western Hemisphere is on that island. In both instances, there's more disease in Haiti than on the Dominican Republic side. All right. Uh, so we, over the last year, went in and a border village that we visit. Uh, um, last week and began helping them to work together, both sides. There's a lot of enmity, but some enmity between Dominican Republic and Haiti for historical reasons don't can't get into. But uh, so we had to encourage them to cooperate against this against this common enemy. They've been doing that. And um, but we pressed them to in advance of President Carter's visit for both sides to get together and develop a binational plan to eradicate malaria from Hispaniola give a target date, have your plan, and estimate what it's going to cost. And do a similar thing for lymphatic fluorosis. But lymphatic fluorosis was a different problem because the Dominican Republic has already, has almost gotten rid of lymphatic fluorosis. They think by 2010 they're going to be done with it. So there the problem is Haiti. And so we had the Haitians develop your plan, target date, money, and uh, the, you know, the plan 
for getting rid of lymphatic psoriasis from Haiti. They did both, and they had press conferences in both instances. The binational plan for getting rid of malaria from Haiti and the Dominican Republic is estimated to cost by 2020 about $194 million. A lot of money, yes? In 2004, there was an outbreak of malaria that cost the Dominican Republic alone $200 million, an estimated $200 million in lost tourism revenues. One outbreak, one country, one year. You've seen President Clinton was just down there the week before we did, trying to help restore um, tourism and other <coughs> development in Haiti. And uh, you can't do it. I mean, you're, you're, you're handicapped in doing it if there's malaria around and people are there. And Haiti, of course, has lots of other problems, but this is one small way. I said to President Carter there that to me, in the Carter Center, we have 10 international health programs. I said to him that to me, that initiative on Hispaniola was the most um, impelling initiative we've done after getting worm disease, where you ask yourself, why hasn't this been done up to now? Why does it take a little NGO with all this money being spent with development agencies and, and, and stuff? Why did it take a little NGO to come and say, wait a minute, this is not right. This needs to be done. We're going to be out of there, and we said that publicly after April 2010, the Carter Center is. We don't need, we've, we've gotten them together now. Uh, Gates Foundation, USAID, uh, the Global Fund, all of those are in there now. Their funding had been funding up to now malaria control. And now they're funding malaria. We'll be funding malaria eradication, and they won't need us. But that's just another small example I want to mention because it was so current. Thank you very much. Thank you.